What if I told you that archaeologists have recently uncovered a letter from one of Jesus' brothers? Would you want to read that letter? Proven. They've proven. They've documented that this letter is from an actual brother of Jesus Christ. Now, I know some of you right now are saying, Jesus had brothers? <laughs> I thought he was an only child. Only begotten, right? Isn't that John 3, 16? He is... He was born of Mary. He is the only begotten of the Father, the Heavenly Father. But after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph were married, and they went on to have a normal family life and had children the way uh, all, of us do, all of us do. And so in one scripture in your Bible, they came to Jesus, and they said, Lord, your mother and your brothers are here. So we know that Jesus had, I guess you'd call them half-brothers, because same mother, different father. And, uh, and so Jesus had these brothers. Now, what if I told you they discovered a letter written from an actual brother of Jesus and they've proven it? Would you want to hear from that letter? Good. Open your Bible and turn to the book of James. And when you get to the title, you will see it as James, the brother of Jesus. And you say, why is this book so powerful? Because if somebody believes that their brother is the Messiah, he must really believe he's the Messiah. Because I've never believed any of my sisters were divine. And they didn't believe I was either. So if you can convince a sibling that you are the son of God, you must really believe that you are the son of God. And James believed, but he did not believe before the resurrection. He, in fact, did not believe Jesus was the son of God until after the resurrection, which means that there was a literal resurrection. And it was so powerful that Jesus' own brother fell to his knees and received his brother as his Lord and Savior. So That's why James, when you read the book of James, there's so much octane in this book. But before I get into it, let's have a little fun. It's in just a moment, we're going to bring the students out. We love this service. Kim and I are going to lay our hands on every one of them, and we are going to speak a blessing over them for this new school year. And you say, what do you pray over them, Pastor? Well, I pray that this year God would put his super on their natural, and they'll have a supernatural school year. And I believe it. I really believe it. Supernatural grades, supernatural achievements, supernatural open doors, supernatural opportunities are coming to their lives. And uh, we're going to pray that over them in just a moment. But let's have a little fun since it's kind of back to school. Uh, you want to feel like a kid again. And some of you are going to enjoy this. It's going to be a stress reliever. I want you to turn and look at somebody and stick your tongue out at them. Just go ahead and do that right now. Just stick your tongue out at them. There are a lot of wives in this room that chose your husband for this assignment. How'd that feel? I had you do that because that's what we're going to talk about today is your tongue. Go to James chapter three. Are you ready? I'm going to take my time. I got my hand in my pocket. Whenever I got my hand in my pocket, you know, I'm, I was going to quote a song, but I decided not to. I, I say it to Kim all the time and she laughs at me. What is it laid back? with my mind on my money and my money on my mind. <laughs> James chapter three, verse number one. Let's do this, are you ready? Here's his first words, my brethren, my brethren. Now, do you remember growing up in church and we referred to everybody as brother and sister? There was no Mr. and Mrs., it was brother and sister. Brother Petrie, Sister Petrie. I give you full permission to call her Sister Petrie because she despises it and I love it. Like Sister Petrie, I call her that at home, Sister Petrie. You say, where did that come from? You have a group of people who have recently been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. They have, they have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and it has so radically changed their life and they are so filled with the love of God, that they no longer saw each other as parts of a different family. 
but they saw each other as part of the same family. And so they started looking at each other saying, you're my brother, you're my sister. So when James is writing, it's like he's writing a letter to his family. And he says, my, my brothers. And as he goes through this letter, let me explain this. He's not being gender specific. When he refers to man, he's referring to mankind. When he refers to brothers, he's referring to the sister in as well. So my brethren and my sister in, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. I love that he admits that. Here is somebody who is the brother of Jesus admitting he doesn't get it right all the time. We all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Think about the sins you commit with your body. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. And James comes along and says, if you could just get control of your mouth, you could keep your body out of sin. That if you can just get this, this in order, everything else in life, in your life, will fall into order. It's a powerful statement right there. The average American has 30 conversations a day. You'll spend one-fifth of your life talking. How many of you know somebody, you're like, ah, they're, they're four-fifths. <laughs> In one year, your conversation, in one year, listen, your conversations could fill up 66 books, each consisting of 800 pages. If you're a man, you speak on average 20,000 words a day. If you're a woman, you speak on average 30,000 words a day. Which means as a man, you get all your words out at work. When she gets home, she's still got 10,000 to go. You say, why, why is this? Well, these scientists did this deep study into why women say so many, much more, so, much, uh, so many more words than men. And what they found out is it's because women have to repeat themselves to the men that they're talking to. The truth is they'd say about 15,000 words if the brothers would listen the first time. Time for the altar call. Come to the music right there. We're going to have prayer for marriage in the room. Here we go. Let me tell you a couple quick things about words. Words cost. Words are expensive. I know you pay attention to the economies in our world. Pay attention to the economy of your words. Your words can open doors for you. And your words can shut doors for you. Your words can cost you a marriage, cost you a job, cost you a family, cost you a friendship. I've watched words cost the life of a church. Words. Your words cost. Number two, your words hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You never went to elementary school, did you? Because if you went to school, you know how painful words can be. How many of you grew up with a, a last name that was easy to make fun of? You know what I'm talking like P tree. You can get creative with that. You made fun of. So you know what it was like to be made fun of. You know how that, it, you can say sticks and stuff, but I'm telling you, you get somebody saying the wrong words and it'll crush you. And let me say something to the parents in the room. Your words can crush that child God has given you to raise. The words, there is more mental abuse than physical abuse any day. Husbands, pay attention to the words you speak to your wife. You can abuse her with your words. Now, bruises may not show up on her skin, but they'll forever be in her mind and her emotions. So words hurt. And number three, words last. You want to know how long your words will last? Every word you speak is eternal. Jesus said it like this. Every idle word you speak 
you will give an account of it in judgment. Pay attention to your words. Do you know right now that when you pray, your prayers go into heaven and the Bible says that they are collected in jars and your words are bottled up in heaven in the form of prayers and one day at the end of the world in the tribulation, there are angels that are gonna take the prayers in those vessels and pour them out on the world in the form of judgment and tribulation. That's how powerful your words are and they will go on forever. You, you've heard it said before. Well, I heard this story one time. There was this lady and she just ran her mouth, ran her mouth, ran her mouth. She just destroyed so many lives, so many marriages, so many families. And one day a, a rabbi said, ma'am, may I come over to your house and talk to you? So she said, sure. And he said, do you, do you have a pillow? And she said, well, yeah. And he took a pillow and he took a knife out and he cut that pillow open, walked out to the room, walked out to a window and he shook all the feathers out of that pillow and he handed it back to her and said, now go collect each one of those feathers. She said, well, I could never do that. And he said, and you can't take back the words you're saying either. Pay attention to the words coming out of your mouth. Your words cost, your words hurt, and your words last. Do you know somebody in your life who is good at investing in others with their words? Do you have people in your life that when you get in their presence, they just make you feel better? I mean, they, they are so skilled with encouragement. They are so effective in the words they speak. When they give you a compliment, you believe every word of it. I mean, you just walk away feeling better about yourself. They've made an investment in your life by simply using words. Now, how many of you know somebody who has depleted your life by their words? You know those people, they walk into the business meeting and you're like, oh, I thought you'd call an absent today. Because you know they're just going to suck the life out of the room. They're just going to suck the life out of you. They're, gonna rem they're just going to pull the life out of you. Pay attention. Now, you may be saying today, you know what? I really don't know anybody who subtracts with their words. That's because you it. There's nobody's told you because they don't want to be around you. When a person makes investments with their words, you want to be around that person. When a person is subtracting with their words, you want to get as far away from that person as you can. Be a person who uses your words to build people up. It is easy. Anyone, anyone can tear people down. There's a pile of rocks everywhere you can pick up and throw at somebody, but just be careful because when you use that pile of rocks, somebody else has got a pile they're going to throw at you. So pay attention to your words. Here's the first big idea. My tongue directs where I go. No, my vision, no, my mind, no, my purpose. No, your tongue directs where you go. James chapter three, verse three. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. The tongue equals power and direction. Consider a bit in a horse's mouth. Here you've got a huge stallion, two to 3,000 pounds and a 95 pound jockey can climb up on the back of that massive thoroughbred stallion and direct him wherever he wants to go and make him run as fast as he wants him to go. That jockey can control the tremendous mighty horse by a tiny piece of metal stuck strategically over that horse's tongue. Your tongue is directing the course and the direction of your life. A little bit, everybody say a little bit. A little bit, a little bit, a tiny little bit of a word or phrase can influence the total direction of your life. You keep thinking, well, if I say big bad things, that's, that'll alter my life. No, I'm saying it's those little things that you say without even thinking about. That is what is de determining the direction of your life. Mark Twain said it like this. The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. That's the power of a little word. 
Here's what James said in chapter 1, verse 26. Listen to this. If anyone among you thinks he's religious. Now let's define the word religious. Religious means a servant of God. Someone who serves God. Someone who is in service to God. So James said, if any of you think you are a servant of God and serving God, but does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, heart, this one's religion is useless. Redefine religion. Service to God. I volunteer every Sunday. My tithes are given every Sunday. I'm faithful to church. I'm faithful to reading my Bible. I'm faithful to all these things. Why isn't God showing up in my life? Because you've not gotten control of your mouth. And what James is saying is all of your service to church, all of your service to God is useless unless you get control of your mouth. Verse four, look at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. If you've ever had the opportunity to go on a cruise, you know these ships are like cities out on the water. They're, they're massive. It's the, some of the big, one of the biggest things I've ever seen. But if you could ever look just under the surface, that rudder that is directing that entire cruise ship is so small in comparison to the ship. And yet that small rudder and a tiny wheel can turn that ship wherever the captain wants it to go. If you don't like the direction of your life, check your rudder. Because your life is moving in the direction that your rudder is taking it. And do you know what ships have to do when a storm's coming? We were, on a, we were on one one time. And I mean, these waves were massive hitting the ship and the, the swimming pool on the inside. It would empty out on one side and it would come crashing down 20 foot. High. It was amazing. It was so much fun. I, I slept better than I'd ever slept in my life. I was, man, I was like Jesus on the ship. That's what I, I was like. I'm just going to do what my master taught me to do. I'm going to sleep in the storm. But do you know how a ship survives a storm? it turns the rudder to go straight at the storm. If the rudder turns the wrong direction in a storm and the wave hits that ship on the side, it'll capsize, it'll turn over, it'll sink. You gotta watch your rudder in storms because that the enemy, your, that devil that's coming against your life will get you pointed in the wrong direction in a storm and that storm will overtake you, overwhelm you. So watch your rudder. Watch your rudder. Just a small steering wheel guidance system. I don't like the direction my life is going. All you got to do is change the way you talk. It's that easy. Let's go a little further. My tongue can destroy what I have. My tongue can destroy what I have. Listen to this. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles. That word defiles there means to stain or to spot. So your tongue is staining your life. It's defiling. It is bringing impurity into your entire body. Your entire life is affected by your tongue and sets on fire the course. Watch this. The course of nature, or you could also say the natural. It sets on fire the natural course of things, and it is set on fire by hell. Verse eight, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Have you ever met a verbal arsonist? I mean, wherever they go, there's just fires everywhere. Buildings on fire, families on fire, marriages on fire, and you can, you can just, oh, I know who did that. Because anytime they get into a conversation, their words are just always inflammatory. I remember a person used to come to, uh, back when I first became pastor, and we'd hold meetings, and there was this one person, every time they would speak up, I'd just go, oh. Because I knew when they got done, I was going to have to put out fires all over the church. 
every time. They were a verbal arsonist. He says the whole course. When he says whole course, he is introduced. He said your tongue can change the course of the natural. So God sets things in order the way they should be. And there's a natural course to these things. A seed goes into the ground. The seed dies. The seed begins to grow. Uh, after a long time, a tree may be in that place where that seed fell. That tree then begins to produce flowers. Those flowers are pollinated by the bees. Once they're pollinated, the flowers become a fruit. Within that fruit, there are seeds. When the fruit drops from the branch of the tree, it falls down and the seeds go back into the ground. They die and the whole course starts all over again. There is a course to everything. And James is saying your tongue is messing up the course of the way God intended your life to go. And it starts a chain reaction. If you wouldn't have said that, this wouldn't have happened, and this wouldn't have happened, and this wouldn't have happened, and this wouldn't have happened. How did all this happen? Because you didn't get control of your mouth right there. And now the whole course is set on fire. And know what he said, notice what he says. It's set on fire by hell itself. You say, I don't want to go to hell. So why do you let it in your mouth? Your tongue's on fire by hell. Couples come in, we counsel them. Well, she said this, and well, he said this. Well, then she said this, and then he said this. And I look at him and say, well, then what happened? All hell broke loose. Well, you opened the door. You were the key. Hell got into your marriage through your mouth. Hell got into your children through your mouth. Hell got into your future through your mouth. That was the only entrance hell had was your mouth and you opened the door. He goes on to say, it's inherently evil. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Your tongue is inherently evil. It's passed down. Here's what he means. Your default setting. The negative in your mouth is your default setting. The evil coming out of your mouth is your default, your default setting. Hatred and anger and division spewing out of your mouth, that's your default setting. You've got to learn to manage your mouth, not only because it can direct where you go, but it can destroy everything you have. How many marriages do you know that were destroyed because somebody couldn't shut their mouth? You know how many counseling sessions I sit in? I just want to look at him and say, will you shut up? No, I mean it. That's the, that's the spiritual advice you need today. Shut up. Well, I got to say the first thing that comes to my mind. No. No, you don't. Because you ain't too smart. Shut up. How many problems would we solve in this world if people would just learn to shut up? For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Me and my dad, we went to this um, reptile. There was like a museum. We were somewhere and they had a reptile museum. And we walked in, and I'll never forget, I walked by the window, and there was in this glass, it was called an albino spitting cobra. And it was, man, this, this thing was spooky looking. And while we were standing there at the glass, this thing raised up, and that hood came out, and it has this ability to shoot venom from its mouth. You know what? With snakes like that, they don't even have to bite you. They can just spit at you. Be careful when you get in the presence of a spitting cobra. Be, be careful when you get in the presence of people that always have venom in their mouth. Because if you get close enough, they ain't even got to bite you. They'll just spit it on you. So what do we need to do? <laughs> Pastor, this sounds like the most hopeless message you've ever preached. 
Well, let's get into it. Tell somebody, check your filter. I don't even think the problem is the tongue. I think the problem is the filter. Because your tongue is being powered by something else. Your tongue may be the engine. Your tongue may be driving this vehicle. But there's fuel from somewhere. The problem is your heart. Because what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. Verse 9, listen what he says. With our tongue, we bless God, our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude, the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren and sistren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring, now he's talking about the source, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? God, what did he say there? He's saying the source is the problem because that water's coming out of the same opening. But what is bringing the water? So can sweet or can, can spring and, and, and bitter water come from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren and sistren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. I want to read this to you in the message translation. Listen to this. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth? My friends, this cannot go on. A spring doesn't gush fresh water one day and brackish the next, does it? Apple trees don't bear strawberries, do they? Raspberry bushes don't bear apples, do they? You're not going to dip into a polluted mud hole and get a cup of clear, cool water, are you? One minute, praising God. And the next minute, cursing people. Made in the image of God. Whew, man, pastor, I know a church that needs to hear this. No, our church needs to hear this. You want to know why? Because you shout with people in here and curse at them in the parking lot. Why ain't they going? Will they go? Will they just turn? What are they waiting on? Nobody's coming. Will you just go? You don't know how to drive. My goodness, you should have never got a license. Ten minutes earlier, you were standing in here going, the Lord is good. His mercy and bless you endureth forever and ever. <laughs> we are messed up. <laughs> I know I got to check my, I check myself whenever I'm standing in a line at checkout at a grocery store and somebody, when the lady says you owe this much, they then start looking for their form of payment. And I'm like, did she surprise you? Did you not know this was coming? Did you think something different was going to happen? Did you, did you think today you got free groceries? You couldn't have been ready for this moment? One minute we're praising God, and the next minute we're cursing people made in the exact image of him. We come in here and we shout, my God can do anything. But I don't know if my kids are going to make it. That one ain't too bright. He's Jehovah Jireh. Jeho Thank you. He's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord, my provider. Honey, we're so broke, I don't think we can pay attention. I don't think we can pay this bill this week. When they call, just say, we're another family. That family moved. We're another family. <laughs> Do you know, and I hope this, I'm, so, so what I'm doing now is I'm giving you the warning so we don't do it. I will stand in here and I will bless your children as they walk through this line. And then you get out on Monday morning and speak a curse over them. How stupid are you? How dumb are you? Aren't you any smarter than that? You're never going to amount to anything. What you just did was whatever blessing I put on them, you just took it off. And you did it by your mouth. How many, how 
many miracles have you canceled? How many blessings have you canceled? Daniel prayed and the angel got to him 21 days later. And Daniel said, where you been? He said, Daniel, I was sent the first day you prayed, but I've been fighting the powers of darkness of the air and it took me 21 days to get the answer to you. Don't cancel your blessing on day 17. Don't curse your miracle because it didn't show up on day 20. Well, you don't know my heart. Yes, I do. Because I heard your mouth. I know exactly what's in your heart. See, you opened your mouth and showed me what you're made of. I know what's in you. Talk. I know what's in your heart because that's what you communicate. It's Proverbs says it. Jesus repeats it. Jesus said it is out of the abundance or the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. My filter's messed up. I got one of these um, smart thermostats in my house. And I walked by it the other day and there was a message on it. I didn't pay attention to it. The house felt cold. Walked by it again and another month and another month. Finally, one day I stopped to read it and it said, reminder, you need to check your filter. And I'm going to use this as a public service announcement. Some of y'all need to check your filter in your house. This was taken out of a person's house. This is what it was supposed to look like. You're breathing this. And finally, what's going to happen, Elder Steve owns a great heating and air company. We have other people. Elder Foster owns a great heating and air company. We have people that do this for a living. And they call people when it's 97 degrees outside and they say, our air conditioner's not working. It's broken. We need a new system. And they say, check your filter. Because the filter's clogged. The filter has collected all this stuff so it can't operate the way it was created to operate. And it's not functioning the way it was designed to function. And what happens in your heart is your heart gets filled up with all the negativity of this world. And your heart gets filled up with all the darkness in this world. And your heart gets filled up with all the anger and all the division in this world. And all of a sudden your whole life starts shutting down. Why? Check your filter. Because what happens is when your filter gets clogged, it affects the air coming out of your vents. When your heart filter gets clogged, it'll affect what's coming out of your mouth. Now, let's say me and you go to a a nice restaurant, nice, fancy, and we order coffee at the end of dinner, and they come out and they say, oh, we've got a nice pour-over coffee, fancy. It's, It's just a longer way to do drip coffee. It's the same thing. And they're going to do this pour over and they, they bring out, they, they got this little pot, they got the hot water, they got the coffee and they take this filter, this nice pristine filter and they put it down in there and then they start putting the coffee into the filter and then they bring in the hot water and they start pouring the hot water over the coffee. You got to pour it in, let it sit for 30 seconds so it can kind of um, absorb some of the water, release that aroma, you know, it's a fancy way to do it. And then you start adding more coffee. And then all of a sudden, this this beautiful liquid energy starts dripping out of the bottom of that filter. Now, what if we go to that same fancy restaurant and the server walks out and says, oh, we got the pot, got the hot water, got the coffee. You know what? We got this old filter. I've only used it about 10 times a day. I think I can get more and more use out of it. Yeah, sounds, smells good. And they put this old, dirty filter Now, what are you going to say? Hold up. Hold up real quick. No, you need a new filter. Is there anything wrong with the water? Nothing. Is there anything wrong with the coffee? Nothing. Is there anything wrong with the pot? Nothing. You're just trying to pour good coffee through a bad filter. And what you're trying to do is live the God life, but your filter's clogged. And your filter's dirty. And you got an old filter. And Jesus said it like this. You can't take new wine and put it in an old wine skin. 
so I can't take my promises and keep trying to push them through that dirty filter you got in your life. So what do I need to do? I need to do what David did. I need to go before God and say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. I need a new filter. High five somebody and say, check your filter. I'm coming to a close. I'm almost done. You can stay standing. I got two things left. When the church was born, God thought this was so important. Watch what he did. And when they were all assembled in one place, they were in one mind and one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And there appeared unto them cloven as of God said, your tongue's been set on fire by hell, but I'm going to give you a tongue that's set on fire by heaven. And what did he do? And they all began to speak with other. The first thing God changed was their tongue because he knew if I don't change the way they talk, the church will never get out of this upper room. So the first thing I got to transform is I got to get that tongue set on fire by hell out of their mouth and get a Holy Ghost tongue in their mouth. I don't need them talking about everything bad in the world. I need them talking about an amazing God that's still in this world and can change this world. I need them preaching the message. You can be healed. You can be saved. You can be delivered. You and your household. Somebody give Jesus a Use your mouth, use your tongue, and bless the Lord. Come on, open your mouth and praise Him. Oh, for a thousand tongues. Oh, for a thousand tongues just to sing His praise. Now teach with me real quick. Help me out. Just look at somebody and say, to change your life, Change your words. Change your life, change your words. But you can never change your words until you get a heart change. You say, is this that important? Is this that vital? Let's go all, we're going, we're going all the way to the end of the book, the end of the Bible. You ready? Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. Put it up. Revelation 12. And they, that's us, overcame him, that's the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the yes, sir. Yes, sir. they overcame the devil I need the blood of Jesus applied to my heart and when the blood of Jesus gets applied to my heart I got a testimony they did not overcome the devil by their complaints. They did not overcome the devil by their whining. They did not overcome the devil by their fear words or doubt words or negative words. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They overcame him by the word. Now, if you're the devil and you know the only thing that can defeat you is somebody's words, what are you going to try to get control of? I'm going to take away the one weapon you have to use against me. And what I'll do is I'll use the power of your words to destroy other people. Come on, sir. In fact, I'll use it to destroy your own life. If our tongue has that much power, it's no wonder why the enemy wants control of it. But I need somebody to lift your hands in this place. Especially if you've struggled in this area of speaking the wrong word, speaking doubt, speaking fear, speaking hate, speak, speaking division, speaking sickness. I want you to ask God because he'll do it. He'll do it. Say, Lord, give me a clean heart. Create in me a new heart, a clean heart. Come on, ask him, God. Ask him, God, my filter. I'm checking my filter right now. My words haven't been right. That means my filter's messed up. So I'm asking you. Touch my heart today, God. Clean my heart today, oh God. Touch my heart with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Give me a new heart. You know what your Bible says? 
that if you would ask God, he would take that stony heart out of you and he would put a soft heart on the inside of you. Ask him, God, take out that stony heart. Take out that rebellious heart. Take out that hateful heart. Take out that fearful heart. Take out that... God, take out that negative heart. Take out that cursing heart. Give me your heart, oh God.